call the Wednesday, May 17th, 2023 school committee meeting to order. Do I have to? If everyone can stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, first line of order is public comment. And I'm just going to say again that each person will be given three minutes, which will be timed. If you're unable to finish within those three minutes, you are welcome to another three-minute period at the second public comment. Anybody? <laughs> Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I am good. So Lynn Greenwood at 393 Tremont. Um, and you know what I'm going to talk about. Um, so just I, I think it's important. I know it's, it's every, this issue is, a, is a, uh, a public school issue, right? So not just Duxbury, OK? Um, New Jersey right now is trying to make the public schools um, apply, go by the CDC recommended schedule. And if that happens in Massachusetts, which probably will, um, then they're going to require the COVID vaccine for school. I'm not saying it's happening, but I'm saying they're trying to do it in other states, so we need to be, be aware. Um, I'm looking for parents that agree with me to join me. Um, I was at the State House yesterday. We had two speakers with our group speaking um, data about the dangers of the vaccine in the members' lounge at the State House. One legislator showed up. That's what you legislate. Well, that's, we're back there tomorrow. We have, um, we're sharing, we have about 50 people coming in with uh, sharing their stories of vaccine, their vaccine injury stories at the State House in the nurses' hall. It's going to be a, a long, crazy day, but um, well worth it. So, um, just so, because <clears throat> right now we all know it's documented when we're going to put those videos from the two speakers. Uh, I will send them to you when they're done. They're about 20 minutes each. I want. I hope you guys will listen to it. I want to get support for the school committee from the community if this does happen, so that we have support in the community. Um, one gentleman just laid out all the children that have died in the state of Massachusetts via the death certificates from the vaccine. Um, there were no deaths of COVID in children under 18 in Massachusetts before all this. Um, and also, I have talked about the website, How Bad Is My Batch? Um, there's another document here, and I've talked about it, where if only 4% of the batches have 71% of the, of the serious adverse events, which that would not happen if they weren't, if they were all the same, they would be the same. So generally, about 4 to 5% of the batches have all the adverse, serious adverse events. Okay, that's... So the good news is that 95% don't. Uh, but that's not mathematically, that's not possible if they all contain the same amount, same things. Um, this, I have this for tomorrow. This is the most current study from the Cleveland Clinic. I can leave this with you. This is, shows the number of batch, the number of doses, and your risk to get COVID. So this shows that from the Cleveland Clinic, the more doses you get, the more likely you are to get COVID. So all this, there's so much data, okay? We should not be giving this to students. Um, anyway, and if we continue to, if, if we support it, um, I'm sorry, if we support it, you're going against your natural instinct of protecting the students, right? Thank you. So, thank you. This is this isn't easy. I'm sorry. So yeah. no, I, I don't think enjoy you did great. it. I'm so. sorry. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Okay, we're going to move on to approval of minutes. Um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes from our May third meeting? So moved. Second. Are there any corrections to be made? I would just I was just wondering Matt did you agree to do the legislation and extra district 
that was, I thought you agreed to that, but not the PAC, and I thought we were going to move PAC to a different one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't recall, but I don't mind. Okay, so I thought it was like um, the DEI collaborative. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Am I wrong with the that? You want to, like the town wide well, ones? I think you have DEI steering committee. Do we already have that? Yeah. I think and she means Duxbury yeah. for All. You were saying Duxbury that you go to the select board. It was the selectmen and the um, Duxbury for All. Well, yes. Because you yeah, said you so, were going to them. Right. Yeah, and I'm happy committee. to continue okay. to do that. Okay. I think that's okay. what it was. Okay. All right. And then, so legislative and extra district, is that just the pack? Well, mm -hmm. le legislative would be the um, select board. Select board. And okay. extra district would be the pack. Okay. So would it be like you, me, and Laurel, if that's how the pack was split? The three of us would be under that same, but you would just do legislation? It should be Can different bullets. Yeah, the, yeah, I think we different. should split them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Do we have to discuss that? Um, well, I think we discussed legislative already at our so last meeting. So that should just be its own category with Matt, because you were going to do the select board? We were. Correct? So can we just make that change and then keep extra legislative will be its own line with Matt okay. and then you can put PAC to be determined. So do you want to say PAC or extra? extra? <coughs> so, mm -hmm. I, think it's it's thing. I think PAC's its own thing. I think we divided it. Yes? No? Well, yes. Yes. I mean, that's the only extra district Correct. right now. The Correct. The question is whether there might be future things that would fall in the bucket, so you leave it broad. But okay. either way. I don't either think way. So, yes. For the next year, it, it is. So we'll do legislative with Matt and then extra district to be determined. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. And then under Q3 financial report, just because I really am hoping we can do it, i just like there to be mentioned that I requested two buses if we have enough money. If that could be written in there too. Okay. Thank you. Any other considerations, questions, comments? Um, I just, I, more of a question. I think um, I do not expect the person taking minutes to document the conversations that we have. I'm wondering if, um, I'm thinking of particularly the, the bullying prevention plan discussion that we had. Um, if it's a matter of just sort of, we record all the meetings, so is it enough to suggest that maybe in the minutes we reference the recording um, during which that discussion took place if somebody wants to? We can't document the conversations or the, the, the I don't you want to call them directives or, or whatever they are. Um, does it make sense in meeting minutes to then have reference recording? For further information or details regarding the conclusions of the discussion. Recordings and the website pages um, for certain discussion items. Okay. So. And please refer to school committee tab under this one. Okay. So, yeah, I think I can't even find it right now. I don't know why. Here it is E. It's E. Um, the last bullet. The last bullet. <coughs> yeah. I mean, just in general. That's fine. Never mind. Go on. Never Do you mind. just want her to add it after that last bullet, after the sentence, the committee further discussed the plan and made the decision to have the bully? Do you refer to recording for full discussion? Yeah. I mean, that would, that would come okay. That's fine. Yeah, we, we've done that in the past. With yeah. The discussion thing. For specifics on you know issues or whatever I guess there's no way to capture what was highlighted as where we had questions or you know issues that we wanted to be taken up specifically this is great general summary um, but I think it would be important to just refer to that given that we're going to revisit it today yeah we got it. okay hey, Suzanne okay so can I have, do I have to do a motion to approve the minutes with the corrections under the liaison appointments, the addition of referring to the, did you have a comment? Oh, I thought someone raised their hand. Okay. Um, adding the comments to refer to the recording under E and adding the buses under the financial report. 
Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Moving on to our reports. We'll start with Dr. Klingeman. So I've invited a special guest for my report. And before Matthew Nijame comes up, Matthew, you can make your way up. Um, I heard from Mr. Maidment this afternoon yeah. about something that wasn't able to get on the agenda. And so he wanted to share that their um, Duxbury crew is attending the Northeast Regional Championships on May 20th and 21st. And a top finish in that, at that event would result in them being able to compete at the National Championships in Florida, oh, wow. June 8th to 11th. Um, so if the team qualifies and decides to attend, up to 18 athletes and two to four coaches would travel to Florida on June 6th, returning on June 11th. And so the itinerary would be depart Duxbury June 6th, return on June 11th, and they'd, they'd have additional um, information to share with school committee if they do qualify. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention, and if necessary, we could call a quick um, school committee meeting to um, share the details of that so that you could approve or not approve that trip for the um, crew team. So Absolutely. That was That's my quick announcement. News. And then I'd like to welcome, I hope all of us can welcome Nat Matthew Nijame, who's been doing a great project for his Eagle Scout project yes. that is directly benefiting Duxbury School. So I invited him to come this great. evening. Welcome. Thanks for coming, Matthew. Of course, of course. Hello. Um, my name is Matt Nijame, or, or Matthew. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Duxbury High School. And I was coming to talk to you a little bit about car idling and the dangers of it and what I'm trying to do to help help this growing, um, this growing problem. Um, so what is car idling? Um, it's when you leave your, uh, your engine, car engines running, uh, parked or waiting unnecessarily. It sounds harmless. Well, it's not really that harmless. Um, there are some serious dangers with the environment, um, public health, and even um, your wallets. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why we're here. I, I'm here today to talk a little bit about it. Um, so let's start off with some of the dangers. Um, the environment. So when we idle, we spew out many greenhouse gases from our, our cars, especially carbon dioxide. These emissions are a big contributor in climate change, causing all sorts of problems like extreme weather changes and messing with our ecosystems in our world and our small town. Um, this is why we see 80 degree days in February and oyster farms having trouble because the bay is warm. Um, second, we have the, the health concerns. Um, when we idle, we, our, our cars spew out pollutants uh, like nitrogen oxides and fine particles. With, when we breathe in these pollutants, it can lead to respiratory issues, allergies, and even asthma attacks. Um, and since we spend a lot of time around idling cars in our schools, um, our schools become s like super big hotspots for these for these exposures to, dangerous, uh, to these dangerous emissions. And victims can be anywhere from teachers to kids just waiting to get picked up each day. Um, lastly, we, we cannot forget about our wallets. Um, when we're leaving our car on, we literally, we're literally wasting fuel. And just think about how much fuel we burn um, every single day unnecessarily. Um, by tackling this issue, uh, we can save these precious resources and redirect the money to more important things like education and school programs to benefit us all. Now that I've talked about all the dangers, um, I want to talk to you about, about what I'm trying to do to, to help prevent these, um, this from happening. So being a Boy Scout in town, I have to do a service project um, for our community to achieve the rank of Eagle Scout. Um, as I was thinking of ideas for the project, I helped write two books, The Carbon Almanac and Generation Carbon. I have, I have a couple. This is, this is Generation Carbon and The Carbon Almanac's right here. And I can pass out some of the Generation Carbon ones after, after the meeting. Um, these books are about the dangers of carbon emissions and things we can do to mitigate these emissions. As I researched the facts for, the, for these books, I realized how much of an impact car idling had on our environment and us. With seeing so many people every day idle at our schools, I, I realized that it would be a great idea to do a project around it. So I decided to put up 10 no idling signs that look just like this um, all around our school. And uh, our school district in Chandler, Alden, DMS, DHS, to try to help contribute in creating a greener world. Um, hopefully, this will lessen the car idling in, at our schools. And so please, if anyone sees one of these signs, just shut off your car and, and we could help help this problem. Um, 
If you want to check out the, the books I helped write, you can go to carbonalmanac.org. Um, the Carbon Almanac has all different sorts of facts and tips um, to help us mitigate our emissions. Um, and Generation Carbon is a more kid-friendly version with a lot more visuals and fun graphics to show the dangers of climate change. Um, lastly, I want to thank Dr. Klingeman. Uh, she is my sponsor for this project. And I, there's been so many challenges and so many things that it's thrown at me, and I, I really appreciate her helping me through it because she, she was just amazing. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Thanks. Matthew. You are, you are my hero because for years I've been emailing the poor principal saying, can you put out a reminder in the school newsletter? And then this year I said to Dr. Klingeman, people are idling, can you say something? And she said, wait till you meet Matt and James and hear about his project. So this is awesome. Thank you so awesome. much. I, I'm so glad to help. It's, oh, it's, it's so personal to me and I, I love doing this. So. Well, I'm glad. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for coming. And Matt donated some of those books for each of the school libraries. Yes. I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's Thank learning you. so much. He's even calling Dig Safe to make sure that where we're putting some of the signs is okay. Yeah. So it's a great learning experience. So wow. Mm -hmm. Proud of him. All right, Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Wilcox. Good evening. Good I wanted evening. to start this evening's update with a literacy assessment change in the past we've used AMSWeb in conjunction with Shaywitz for dyslexia screening. Our elementary committee has met to review current options for screening, and it has been determined that we will be moving to M Classroom Amplify. Um, M Classroom Amplify is approved early literacy universal screening assessment that fully meets expectations under DESE. We will be providing staff with professional development at the beginning of the year um, prior to implementation and we will also continue to use iReady um, at Chandler and Alden in some of our grade levels to provide us with additional student data and online practice. I also wanted to just share that the school wellness um, advisory committee met four times throughout the school year. We discussed parent workshops, we reviewed the bullying prevention plan, we talked about Carousel's implementation, as well as health fair updates and turkey trot information. DESE also has a school wellness advisory initiative, and I've applied for Duxbury to be included in the initiative work. There are two tracks in the initiative. One is for districts who already have a school wellness advisory council, and one is for um, districts who would like to develop school wellness advisory councils. So, um, we've not been notified to see if we're included, but I will continue to keep the committee updated. And at our last meeting, we re reviewed data and noted that anxiety is one of the most prominent topics at all levels. The committee also took information and brainstormed ideas for next year, including adding additional student voice to the committee and asking those students involved in Dragon decisions to be a part of our work. So we're really That's trying great. to include, include more student voice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Director of Business and Finance, Lisa Freely, who will be joining us virtually. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, excellent. Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, since our last meeting, we've processed one warrant, number 46, on May 10th, totaling $441,490.56. Um, and we've received two additional DEF awards, um, one for Allison Graham for chess tournament supplies totaling $564, and one for Emily Mastiff, Mastoff um, for books res um, resulting from diversity audit of the Chandler Library totaling $2,500. As always, we thank DEF for their continued support of these schools. And that's it for today. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Next is our interim director of special education, Valerie Kelly. Hi, everyone. I have a 
more brief update today because we were just here two weeks ago. Um, but I wanted to say thank you to, um, to everyone for their support in increasing our ESY rate. It has increased um, interest. We've gotten five internal candidates um, of oh, staff wow. members here. Two of them have have agreed, and um, it's really helped with staffing. And I've gotten a few um, staff who've come by just to say thank you for increasing the rate. I think it. It meant a lot to them so I just wanted to share out that that had um, positive impact we're working now on um, scheduling and getting those schedules to families and when their specific services will take place like the, the given time and day and so forth um, and I'm staying hopeful that we'll be able to secure full staffing so we're gonna continue to um, have those steadfast efforts and keep you updated as as we progress towards it um, we have ordered the new OT swing for Chandler, and that's in the works, and it's a big enhancement from what was previously there with um, a way to have multiple students get service and use that equipment at the same time, which is great, and it, it, um, it will expand from what was previously there in terms of what it offers for children, which is fantastic. Um, and then with 19 days left of school, we are, or today was the 19, 19 days after today, um, we've been working closely on our consistently on our placement and clustering for students with special education. So that's in full swing, taking into account, um, you know, reviewing and reviewing those different spreadsheets of where students are and having um, different groups of staff look at it holistically to make sure that we're considering all the different parts of students' profiles to make sure that they're set up for success. And this is happening at every building. Um, progress reports will go home along with uh, report cards on the last day of school. And then finally, on June 5th, we have an exciting night with CPAC. We have Dr. Gab coming. Um, she's a Harvard professor who specializes in early literacy um, identification and um, dyslexia. So we are very lucky to have a presenter like that come to town. And it will be held at the Senior Center. There is an RSVP form, so we can just make sure that we accurately account for headcount. That has gone out in the Monday memos. It's gone out um, in our internal listserv for special education families. And we'll continue to kind of push the press on that. And CPAC is doing a wonderful job of putting it out on social media as well. So we're very lucky and excited to have this presenter join us. And is that open to all parents or just special education parents? All parents and also um, all staff, so gen ed staff and yeah. Great, thank you. All right, student representatives. Um, last Thursday, the music department held their annual music awards night where many student musicians were recognized for their outstanding achievements, commitment, and overall contribution to their musical groups. This was many of the seniors last time performing with their musical groups, with the rest of the members going on to perform their last two concerts being Memorial Day and graduation. The superintendent's advisory council application window has been closed and the new cabinet has been elected. Their first meeting will be this Friday where they will, where they will meet with Dr. Adolf Brown. Um, they will also go on to create kindness kits for the homeless as well as help promote and collect items for our food drive that started this week and will bleed into next week. Um, Dr. Brown will also speak to the student body during the last two blocks this upcoming Friday and later that evening the community will have, an, will have an opportunity to listen to him speak from 5.30 to 6.30. On the topic of student involvement, Duxbury Student Council, ZE Board elections were, no, sorry. Um, Duxbury's Student Council held e-board elections this past Monday, which was a huge success, exciting many members of STUCO for the upcoming year. In addition, I know Machine is joining us tonight, and our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Student Advisory Council is opening applica applications for current members to, help, to hold leadership roles, allowing students to further its impact in the upcoming year, and she plans to open up applications for general members very soon. A few of Machine's DEI student leaders will join the superintendent advisory this Friday with Dr. Brown. And lastly, today as well as yesterday, the sophomore class took their MCAS math test. Um, I'll just quickly make a correction with uh, what Chase said, um, but great first report. Uh, this Friday, sorry, that sounds wrong. Uh, this Friday, <laughs> this Friday um, with Dr. Brown, it'll be the current board that has served this entire year for the superintendent's advisory because we figured since they were so um, integral in the planning, it should be them and then the new board will roll in too as we select like the next week. Um, Chase basically covered everything, but a few other things. Uh, the sophomore and freshman class had their spring fling last Friday, um, thanks to student council and their advisors. Uh, this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., there is Touch a Truck, which benefits the, which is that steel and benefits the class 2025 and lion share, which is great for families and really anybody in the community. And finally, given that seniors' last day is this Friday, uh, there's several events for them coming up, which includes um, 
Senior Night Out at Indian Pond Country Club, Senior Sunrise this Friday, uh, Senior Cookout on May 26th, their last day of school, Senior Awards Night May 31st, and finally graduation on June 3rd. That's all I got. Thanks, Michael and Chase. I only have a few things, and I'm surprised you guys didn't mention this, but prom was, was fantastic, right? From red carpet. The red carpet was awesome, and I just want to thank everyone for all their hard work. It was flawless. It's amazing how all those kids and all those cars seamlessly make it through, I don't know what the main street is, and then the red carpet's just phenomenal. All the students looked wonderful. They were so excited. And I just think it's a wonderful event, and you could not beat the weather this year. Last year was freezing. This year it was absolutely beautiful. So I just want to thank everybody involved and tell the students how impressed I was with how they looked and acted and just how overall happy they were. So that is that. Um, I just uh, want to thank Todd, Mr. Warmington, for continuing on in his interim role as principal for next year. Um, Again, stepping up after a very difficult situation and helping our schools maintain some stability, um, especially for the children. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. And I'm the liaison for the high school um, school council. And it has been a pleasure working with Todd and with the parents and the students this year. Um, some really great conversations have taken place. And um, so thank you. Selfishly, I'm so excited you're coming back. and. Uh, We'll do it again. And lastly, just because I want to make sure everyone's aware and okay, um, generally the chair does the speech and diploma handout at graduation. Last year we did split it up. I just want to, it's a special year for me and I'd like to do both. So I just want to make sure the board is okay with me doing both the speech and the handout of diplomas. I can't be there, so <laughs> have at it. All right. And that's all I have. Any other comments from the committee? I have one. I just okay. want to say I um, got to go to the Unified Track um, sectionals last Wednesday in Middleborough, which is where I grew up. Um, it's kind of funny they built this gorgeous high school. But anyways, um, I had the best time for, for like two and a half hours went like that watching the athletes my favorite was the 100-yard dash, just the smiles and the intensity, and it was a blast. And there were parents there, and there were some teachers there, and the peer athletes. And if you haven't gotten to a unified event this year, um, I would try to do so or next year because it's, it's something absolutely tremendous to see. We're going to just move on then to unfinished business, um, which is the PAC liaison. I did reach out to, um, how do you pronounce Dipna. it? Dipna and Thomas, and she responded that um, Duxbury has been a member since it's, of the PAC since its exception, and we are grateful for the partnership. Duxbury can have multiple representatives, however, only one voting member, which would be the primary representative. An alternative can come but won't have any voting rights. As for the primary, oh, that's not important. I just, they need contact information. They try and be efficient with their meetings. So with that being said, would anyone like to be the primary representative for the PAC? Do they tell you when they're going to be vote? I mean, yeah. so the, do they, they vote every meeting? Yeah. And then we just wouldn't vote. We would just not vote that meeting. What would it important be that we vote? abstaining from voting on? What are, what I, are I we? Would, yes, I would say that they would want their members to be able to vote. It they would wouldn't be ideal. have said that we can have an alternative if we had to be there every meeting. I mean, this was. Yep. Matt, what kinds of things do they vote on? Because you are our last row. A lot of the stuff that we vote on. Okay. Whatever. 
Well, I'd rather us, I know because the question is we, like someone mentioned last time, with, we would withdraw. So I'd rather have a primary and a secondary than not have anybody. Right. So, anybody? <laughs> I can't do it. I'm happy to split it with someone. I just know with my work schedule I can't be at every meeting. So I know yeah, that that's just that's yeah, impossible. So, but I don't know. If it's a I shared mean, responsibility, that's fine. I mean, if they need a primary person, but we acknowledge that that person isn't going to be there to vote every time or can't. If the alternate's there, then Duxbury doesn't get a vote. Correct. Is that where we are? Yes. And you can talk to Dipna? Yes. Um, further? about it to kind of work out the logistics yeah I met with Dipna on Monday we had the PAC operating committee and she mentioned that there's interest for multiple Duxbury representatives I think it's just really important that we maintain our presence and if we have to abstain on the occasional time from voting I think that's an okay forfeiture if, as long as we stay involved with the PAC yeah, yeah. I agree that's fine I'm happy to share yeah. okay we'll, have to, we'll just figure it out yep. And I think if there's a conflict with both of you, I'm happy. You know what I mean? It sounds like we can, have someone can, yeah. someone can be there. So that's totally fine. Um, so we're all okay with Laurel, you being primary or Katie? Who wants the voting rights? <laughs> uh, <laughs> rock, paper, away, scissors? That's away. fine. I'll do it. Yep. All right. So we're going to um, put Katie as the primary member for the PAC, the primary representative with Laurel as the secondary. I don't need to vote on that, do I? No. Okay. We're going on to unfinished business and I want to invite Desiree. New business. Oh, new, shoot. What did I say? Old business unfinished. again? Unfinished. Sorry. Moving on to new business. It's been a long day. Um, we're a history museum. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for joining us today. And this is from the Aldred, Alden Kindred of America Incorporated. That sounds very official. Thank you all very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Well, as um, Kristen said, my name is Desiree Mobed and I'm the Executive Director of the Alden House Historic Site and really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to talk to you about the Alden First Site. As most of you probably know, that site is contains what we think are the remnants of John and Priscilla Alden, Mayflower passengers' home. Back in 1627, they received a 100-acre land grant. And over the years, how quickly it goes, right? They raised their family, 10 children, uh, their grandson, of course, another John Alden, um, built the homestead at 105 that people visit today. And, um, you know, eventually that 100 acres, most of it was sold out of the family. So the town of Duxbury acquired some of that land, including the buried and almost forgotten foundation of this original Alden home site, um, which um, eventually now houses the library and all of Duxbury schools. So the effort to preserve this site has required a close relationship between Duxbury Schools and the Alden Kindred that dates back almost seven decades now. And it was actually the school custodian by the name of Russell Edwards, who was also an Alden descendant, who helped the Alden Kindred find an archaeologist and locate that house site back in 1960. At that time, Duxbury was in the process of creating those athletic fields, and by working together, these two organizations um, were able to locate that site, excavate it, and um, before the construction of the school fields began. The schools and the Alden Kindred saved one of the most important sites that provides the evidence of 17th century life not only in Duxbury, but a history that's important for all of America. So our first slide here um, contains an area, the bird's eye view, we love Google Maps there. Um, and you can see, obviously, to the far left is the Alden site. And then, you know, the ball fields, um, the library, and of course, the school complex. Um, that area that's marked 
in yellow is the area near the pine tree um, that has the roped off area of the foundation and then um, uh, you know of this of this area that we're talking about um, the area in red to the south um, is an area of course to the south and in the 17th century world they tended to build their houses facing south so if they did ever expand and you figure 400 square foot house for 10 children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. might have been a, a topic of interest at some point but anyway there might be um, future uh, it might have future archaeological interest to the south um, we haven't um, and that down goes down to the water line there so Duxbury schools in the Elden Kindred um, and then we'll go ahead and switch the slide. So this is the reason why now, why I'm here tonight. So when we were doing research for um, this, you know, just preservation options for this site, we came across this image from 2013, not that long ago. And you can see that there's construction, um, you know, the either parking or ball fields or something. And look how close it comes right up to the area of this site and the National Historic Landmark designation. That kind of grayish area um, includes not only the foundation, but um, what they call archaeological anom anomalies that were identified by a ground penetrating radar survey and, you know, are certainly of potential archaeological interest. Um, so the schools and the Alden Kindred have a wonderful track record of preserving this very fragile piece of history for our children and our community and certainly our nation. But as time passes, we all know that things just get forgotten despite the best of intentions. And so in the decades since that first archeological dig, Massachusetts has developed guidelines that help historic sites preserve history like this. And we're just asking for a commitment or a resolution tonight that allows us to explore options for preserving this site um, for the future. Um, I appreciate your time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. What, it, what was built there? Oh, was anything that 2013 construction? I so I did call to so try to find that out. Yeah, it's I think, a field. It's right. A field now. Yeah, it's a field. So it clearly went, and again, you know, we're, it just these things just happen and so I think us together you know as Stuart you all as owners you know us the Alden Kindred having a role in helping steward it our goals are to preserve the site um, to you know allow visitors to see it because it's very you know it's just so important to stand on the ground of you know an actual historic place and you know just also to have a role in any kind of um, potential future archaeological work. And this is, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm right out in our field. With, it's, is it, roped it is. Yeah, it was actually mm -hmm. it's an Eagle Scout. It was actually an Eagle Scout project okay. several okay. years ago. I don't yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, yes. Well, we could always tell when you all are using the, the ball fields, for sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, visitors come. In our season, you know, most museums, the season is the warmer months, so June through mid-October. Um, and we, you know, it's mostly small groups, family groups. Sometimes it's, you know, larger organized tours. Um, but we send them from our site. Um, so there's an actual f a path cut through the woods that I think actually was also another Eagle Scout project that we was goes back to the 1980s. So you walk through the path, and then there you are at the school ball field. And I have to tell you the number of people who said, I missed it. Oh my gosh, where was it? But um, anyway, there's signage out there now. So usually what they do is they, you know, if there's an athletic event going on, they either turn back and say they didn't want to bother the kids, 
or they'll skirt the area of the field. Um, and, you know, other times when it's not in use, you know, they'll, they'll happily cross the field, get to the site. Um, there's actually an audio tour that's posted there now. Um, we're looking at an augmented reality uh, experience, so you could actually meet John and Priscilla, and there's some limited signage. So, Desiree, is it because they have to cross the field to get to the site that's the problem? Or um, is I mean, the kids aren't playing on the actual site, are they? No, okay. no, okay. no. So no, yeah. to the left. So they have to yeah. cross the field, and that's they don't want to. Cro they don't want to. Oh, the visitors. Yeah, yes. they don't want to disturb. You know, any so kind of it's the athletics. Access from. They'll your walk study? around it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and usually they, you know, it's sort of they just people just figure it out. Okay. You know, so I think that you know, hasn't been a problem when, okay. you know, we share with you all our open hours so that you have the schedule. If there's, a, you know, a special tour coming in, we'll usually call the school and say, oh, by the way, you know, this, you know, this group is coming, just so everybody knows, you know, who might be, who might be out there. Right, so no one's interfering with the other, but it's all just No, no, they're, they're pretty, yeah, they're pretty respectful so of that. If we did a um, um, like a memorandum of understanding between the two entities, just to you know put on paper what we're already doing, but because I, I think from what we talked about, the mm -hmm. concern is that um, you know everyone wants to preserve that first site. Right. The first site happens to be on school property. Yeah. There are no plans to ex you know for us to do any you know yard work on that or to, right. to disrupt it. But I think we all want to keep it, you know, um, you know, keep it. It's an awareness. In a way, so it's almost right. sort of like an awareness between right. the two, in a in a memo of understanding. Right. So and and also, you know, just constant communication. Like we didn't yeah. know about that 2013 project, but just you know, formalize. It's really to formalize the the arrangement yeah. has worked for 60 years. So, you know, it, but to formalize it going forward is, you know. Is, yeah, and when, you know, so gets, when yeah. Tom Delano, who's on your board, mm -hmm. first contacted me, <clears throat> I think, I don't think he was like concerned, but mm -hmm. you know, he watches the school committee meetings, right. and when he saw that there was, you know, funding approved to do work on the field, he's like, God, I hope they don't do anything to the site. And of course, no right. one would, but we just don't have it on paper. So, right, I think that um, I don't think there's currently a problem, and Desiree and I have spoken right. at length just that eventually it won't be us that are in right. charge of the um, school department and the yeah. kin Alden Kindred relationship and ensuring that um, there's not future projects that take place without involving the Kindred and I think um, I think we have a great shell of a memorandum of agreement that we could have um, presented to the school committee um, in the Alden Kindred mm -hmm. and I would just like to suggest that we add to that which we hadn't before that a member of the Alden Kindred Association take part and if we ever got to the point of having a building project for Alden School if we were looking at a potential renovation or rebuild when we are moving through the process if we are accepted into the MSBA pipeline I think it would be important just to have it documented that someone from the Alden Kindred Association would be on that building committee because um, we would make sure that when we speak to any um, architects that we preserve that space and that we don't talk about parking lots or putting any kind of building anywhere near that site and we also just want to preserve the fact that um, communication between the Alden Kindred Association, Alden House, and Alden School for any kind of um, visits to the school to make sure it's a good day with Alden School. They don't want right. to find out that it's field day um, when we have a large tour group coming in. So Desiree's great about contacting Mr. E just to let them know if there's anything planned and to make sure it works. Um, so we just want to formalize that relationship and agreement and that way generations to follow right. will um, We'll continue to keep that in mind if there's ever a plan to put a parking lot there to expand the field, especially into that wooded area where um, yeah. where there may very well be additional um, unexcavated archaeological right. places that haven't been um, reviewed. I, I, I feel good about that. So um, 
I move that the school committee direct Superintendent Klingeman to draft a memor memor memorandum of understanding between DPS and Alden, Alden Kindred of America to preserve the Alden first site and continue visitor access. Um, and Dr. Klingeman could present that draft to us, I mean, maybe in the September meeting. Yep, absolutely. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Does that sound good, Desiree? Well, it sounds good, and we will look forward to working with you on that. Thank you Excellent. very much. We're going to move to the school improvement plan reports with our <laughs> elementary principals. Thank you, Desiree. I didn't say Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. So um, we are here to talk about our school improvement plans tonight. Um, you have a completed copy, I think, of the Chandler School Improvement Plan, plan from your materials this week. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about any of the goals that I have in there. But tonight, I'm really going to focus on Strategic Objective 3 and um, hoping to just share some data with you to outline the success of that goal. So the objective three was really around data and our process to um, use purposeful data alignment of assessments and professional development. So we reviewed and implemented revised data team protocols for our universal screeners and tiered intervention identification. We also implemented enhanced tiered intervention system for literacy instruction in K-2, and with the addition of our math specialist position, enhanced the tiered intervention and data collection in math in K-2. So I'm going to share some data with you that just highlights um, how we've sort of accomplished that goal. So first, as a reminder of what tiered intervention means, tiered intervention is a system of supports for students in general education. All students receive tier one classroom intervention, or instruction, excuse me, which consists of both whole group and small group. Research shows that for about 80% of our students, um, tier one instruction will allow them to make progress. For some students, they require more support, and this is what we call tier two. Generally speaking, about 15% of our students may require tier two support, and this is a second dose of classroom instruction. So this is delivered in small groups by either classroom teachers or interventionists. And interventionists mean our three reading specialists, our math specialist, or our, re our math tutors. For students who receive, who require more support than that, um, which may be expected to be around 5% of students, we provide them with tier three support. And that is explicit and intensive instruction, which is a different mode of delivery than tier one and two. Thank you. So this slide breaks down the tiers a little bit further. Tier two is generally given um, three to five days per week for 30 minutes at a time in small groups by the classroom teacher or interventionist. This is, like I said, another dose of reteaching the core curriculum materials. Students in Tier 2 are progress monitored every two to four weeks. Tier 3 adds another 30 minutes on top of what students are given in Tier 2. And this is taught in smaller groups by an interventionist or sometimes a special educator. And these intervention groups work on Tier 1 concepts as well as remediation of foundational skills. So on the next slide, it shows these are the assessments that we use. So as part of our school improvement goal number three this year, um, focusing on intervention, we looked at our assessments and our data team protocols. We have several assessments in each grade level for both reading and math. So three times a year we give these, which are called universal screeners. For kindergarten, we use Ames Web, Early Literacy, and Early Numeracy. And for grades one and two, we use Ames Web, Early Literacy, I ready math and um, I ready reading. As Dr. Wilcox pointed out, next year we'll not be using Ames Web anymore, so we're um, switching to M class, which is a DESC approved early literacy screener. So the data team, which is led by Sarah Milner, our curriculum supervisor, um, consists of our reading specialists, our math specialists, and math tutors, and our classroom teachers. 
They meet after the fall and winter benchmark period to determine which students require intervention, what kind of intervention it should be, and which students do not require it anymore. So if a student requires intervention, it's important to understand that it doesn't mean that they'll require it forever. Um, so we monitor each student's progress regularly while they're receiving the intervention to make sure that it's working. Um, and then the data team also meets to discuss the progress monitoring um, assessments in between the benchmarking periods. So the next slide, this shows a, um, an example of a graph that we have for an individual student for progress monitoring. This is a student who's been receiving intervention in reading and every one to two weeks has been given an assessment as a progress monitoring measure. This particular chart is showing Ames Web oral reading fluency, but we can create a chart like this um, for any of the measures that we use for progress monitoring. The next slide shows an example of a whole grade level's worth of data that teachers can see um, to you know, monitor the progress of the whole grade level at once. This particular example is showing the um, all students in grade one this current school year in the fall um, and winter for oral reading fluency. So in the fall, you can see we had 110 out of 193 students, or 57%, starting out not needing intervention. Um, but, and then you can see the yellow and the red are the numbers and percentages of students who started out the year um, qualifying for intervention. It's important to remember that this is the beginning of first grade, the first two weeks of school. Students have not been required to read um, oral, orally um, timed before this. This is the first time they've ever done this. But um, by the winter, we had 80% of our students meeting that benchmark. Um, and this includes all students in grade one this year. So we're excited to share um, our spring data with Dr. Klingeman after it's completed. Um, next week and the week after, we'll be collecting that data, so we'll be sure to share that as well. But we're really um, excited about the progress so far this year. So as part of our school improvement goal, it was really to discuss how we identify students for intervention and how they're moving in and out of the different tiers. So I wanted to give you some context for what that looks like in each grade level for both reading and math. So this graph shows the total number of students in each grade level in blue. And then in yellow, you'll see the number of students who've received intervention at some point in the year. Remember that this number isn't static. So just because they were receiving intervention doesn't mean those are the total number right now receiving it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the green bar shows how many students have exited intervention already this year or are on track to exit given their current progress monitoring data. I'm going to break this down further in the following slides for you. So in kindergarten this year, um, we have had the graph on the right shows you um, we have a total of 207 students in kindergarten this year. Of those 207, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the graph on the left <laughs> in the, with the blue, we have 207 kindergarten students, 29 students have received intervention in reading at some point during the year, as shown in red. The graph on the right then shows you what happened with those 29 students. So of those 29, the green is 15 students who've already exited intervention. The six students are, who are on track to exit by the end of the year, given their data at this point and eight students who are likely to have to continue with intervention um, given the spring benchmark. Okay, so um, on the next one, it Can shows. I just ask a question? Sure, please. So intervention means over the summer or into the next grade? Into the next grade. Okay. Yep. Thanks. So, um, so this is the same group of kindergartners for math. Two hundred seven total students. Um, 12 students were identified as needing intervention at some point this year in math. Um, and then on the right, those 12 students, four of them have already exited, four of them are on track to exit, and four are likely to continue. Erin, um, would you like to there? Maybe I should just wait. Keep going. Is okay. intervention tier two, like is that considered intervention? Yep, yeah. so tier two or That's tier three. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. what is what is the overlay with SPED, or is that are those mutually? Ex so um, some it depends. 
it depends on the child. Some students who are on IEPs um, receive intervention based on their needs and some don't. Um, some receive specialized instruction through their IEPs. It just depends. But like that chart that I showed of the overall grade level, that shows every student in the whole grade. Okay. So, um, okay, grade one reading intervention. So in grade one, we have 192 students. Um, <clears throat> At some point this year, 49 of those students have received some type of intervention, either tier two or three. Remember that this is not all at once. This is just students who have received it and may have exited at some point. So of those 49, um, 16 of them have already exited, 17 are on track to exit, and 16 are likely to need to continue. For grade one math, out of the 192, we have um, 34 students who've received intervention. 13 of those 34 have already exited, 10 are on track to exit, and 11 are likely to continue. Grade two reading, we have um, 217 total students in grade two. 41 students have received intervention at some point throughout this year in reading. Of those 41, 13 have already exited, 15 are on track to exit, and 13 will likely continue. And then um, finally, math intervention. In grade two, we have um, 44 students who've received intervention. 19 of those are, have exited, eight are on track to exit, and 17 will likely continue. Um, I'm going to jump. So, if you do, you want to ask questions about that part, and then I can. I'm going to jump to um, just math intervention. I have a question. Sure. So, how is that? So, their incoming third grade teachers are told that they they see these reports and know that they there's still this group of kids. So, this child needed intervention. Yep. So, the first two weeks of school, though, we redo all the assessments. So they have, um, they will have the second grade data, yep. but they also have the beginning of the year third grade data. Right. So, so they're, you know, there do I think that there's only going to be, you know, six right. kids in okay. kindergarten that received intervention going into first grade? Probably not. Yep. But that's what our end of year data shows. But then, you know, first grade is a, a jump up in skills, certainly, and in, in different assessments. So it's going to show a different number. So we do them every, that's why we do them three times a year. Right. Thank you. And then do you, did you, do you do the same? assessments for like um, so first grade and follow those first grade or kindergartners through first grade and then into second grade so with Ames web we do because we have that um, K up but um, I ready only starts in first grade we don't use that with kindergartners okay. so I think that would be neat for us to see mm -hmm. I mean I know we're not doing Ames web anymore but kind of curious like how many of the kids that scored out are still in second or in second grade didn't need to come back in for services again. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? No. So tell me what more. What so you I mean. just kind of like to see like we're seeing first grade, second grade, or kindergarten, first, second. <laughs> I'd almost like to see the same group of kids, like. So we, like can, a we have that through Ames thing. Web that? through the end of this year because we've used it for a number of years. So we can yes. pull those reports certainly, yeah. and even um, just ongoing like that mm -hmm. would be. I'd like to see that. This is wonderful. Yep. And just to next add, year we yes. will start over though. We won't yes. have longitudinal data because we're having we will have a new um, assessment system. So um, we can get everything out of Ames Web while we still have it. Yeah, that's yeah. great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thinking about just math intervention, because I know that, um, you know, we've been able to, um, part of our school improvement goal was really to talk about how our math specialist position that we've added this year has really impacted us. So for the last two years, it's important to remember we haven't been fully staffed with our math interventionists. Um, in 2020, 2021, we actually only had one math tutor of the three possible positions. So even though the need was there, we were just unable to support all the students with just one person. So this graph on the left shows the number of students we were able to support with one math tutor in blue. Those are the students who were supported. And the green shows the number of students that would have qualified for support with the math tutor if we had had the staff. That's great. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, those supports just had to be covered by the classroom teachers. Um, which was doable and we did it, but um, obviously we'd like to have the additional support. So similarly then on the right, we have 2021-22, um, we had two math tutors, 
Um, the students in blue are the number of students who were able to be supported with those two people, and then the green on top were the kids who were supported by classroom teachers, but would have otherwise been supported by interventionists. And then finally, I'm sorry, I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> the, um, this year being almost fully staffed, we still are supposed to have three math tutors, and we actually did just hire our third math tutor um, a few weeks ago. But um, this is middle of the year intervention data when we had two math tutors and our math specialist. And you can see that of all the students in blue that were identified, we were able to support, which is the first time in multiple years. So that's great. Um, so hopefully this um, shed some light on that um, goal three, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Do you find that, like you said, they move up a grade, so then the skills get harder and you know, like, they haven't seen a lot of it yet, so you have kids who might qualify for support, but do you see that you have more kids move out between like that first fall assessment and then the, set, the winter one? Like they they just needed to get back in the swing they of things, basically. Sometimes, like, yeah. You know I mean, they, it's like the that summer definitely slide happens. where. Yep. That definitely happens, and I think what, like you saw that in the first grade yeah, data. Yeah, that's what it's, I mean, because I it, feel like you like, yeah. had kids graduate out because they just kind of came back and needed like a. That does happen. Yeah, sure. yes. okay. Um, Aaron, can you go, just go, uh, yeah, keep, keep going back, keep, yeah, so one more, one more, sorry. When you're looking, I guess, at, um, I'm trying to understand the overlay, so if there were eight kids who needed intervention in reading in kindergarten, mm -hmm. and then first grade, there are 49, mm -hmm. so what why is that, I guess? Or so, what, why do you see that bounce? And then it seems to level out in second again. So the first, um, the, first assess, the first time we assess oral reading fluency, which is literally like you give the kids a passage and they have to read it as many words as they can in one minute. They're yes. timed, yeah. right? And so um, they've never done that before. They don't, that's not a requirement in kindergarten at all. Right. And so you know, that pops up a lot of kids. Like, like Katie was just saying, that, that definitely flags a lot of kids. Um, and, you know, sometimes kids just need a little bit of a boost to have that practice and then they are back out of intervention. Um, and that might just look like, you know, extra time practicing fluency um, or, you know, it may, based on the iReady data as well, the diagnostic, that gives us more information. So it just kind of depends on the child and we have to just kind of make those groups based on what the needs show in the two Right, and, and so then I'm trying to, so then in second grade, you've got 41 again, like a big group. Is there a similar bump there that's causing <coughs> that group? Are those the same kids? Uh, I guess I'm trying to Not understand. Not necessarily, right. And I think like, you know, it's important to see though, like 16 of those kids already have exited out, you know, so, right. um, so we're ending the year with basically planning for 13 have already exited, 15 are about to exit, you know, and so some of that may just be coming back over the summer and, you know, that first assessment, those are given, like I said, the first two weeks of school. Right. So it's really like to get that baseline data for teachers so that they can see right away, um, so that we can get on it right away with small groups and make sure we are supporting kids right away in September. So it's just, it's not like 44 kids all at once. Right. You know, so it could be like 20 kids at a time per grade level, maybe seeing an interventionist, but that moves around. Right. It's hard to kind of quantify and, and show simply like that, because it's really not simple. Yeah. It's really, um, there's a lot of moving pieces to it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I love the, d the data. I think it's great. Um, I know I push this every time. I would just love the last column of the school improvement plans to be more like um, goal oriented and not checklist, like you've accomplished X, Y, and Z. I'd like it to be more of kind of the data, not how you're achieving it. So mm -hmm. onto like for next year, mm -hmm. I think I would meet, like to see more of that than checklist, so. Yeah, I think that the tricky thing with the school improvement plan, I think it's the model that, that we using really um, and probably the nature of like how we've done it in the past um, it's hard for me to understand the evidence column to me if we're talking about like evidence of accomplishing the goal 
um, it, it they're not as as we have it set up they're not outcome based at all so I guess I'm sort of imagining and how these elevate to the strategic plan and I realize we have three more years of the strategic plan but if you have that in four years how do we determine whether we've leveraged professional time by creating and implementing a plan that empowers teachers as curriculum leaders and if we don't define that now on how we are going to determine whether or not we've attained that goal and the benchmarks and indicators that will tell us that we're going to come to 2026 and the community should be asking you know how have how did we do how, how did we get there um, and I think that's the challenges I think forward to that of what we define as evidence and how we determine whether or not we've achieved a goal, um, it ha there, have, there has to be some level of outcome-based pieces. Process is incredibly important, and especially in year one and year two, you would expect to kind of see those, the action steps are process-based, but you still have to have an outcome indicator at the end of it that's gonna tell you whether you got there or not. And I think that's, I think that's what you're speaking about a little bit, um, and it's early, I get that. But I think as we think about how we use these and how it all ties together into that bigger picture, and, and this is the data you guys are presenting is part of it. It's just a matter of figuring out how to translate that into the indicators that we then apply to determine whether or not we're there. Does that make sense? All right, thanks for having us here tonight. I'm, I'm gonna present uh, some evidence towards action steps for our objectives uh, one, two, and three, so three of the four that I commented on in uh, in the fall, and then I'll also talk about um, some of our in intervention status data too. So this kind of outlines our strategic objective one: build connected and interactive school and community partnerships. Uh, I'm going to highlight our work on our student advisory plan and our work with several community partners. Um, for two, which is integrate and practice inclusive and culturally responsive instruction for all students, I'll explain. Um, our work establishing what we call the collaborative student tracking team this year. And for three, uh, which was establish a, a pre-K to 12 grade aligned standards based curriculum, I'll talk about some of the steps we've taken, training with training, professional development, coaching, communication, data meetings, and student support team. So um, to dig into strategic objective one, we can go to the next slide. Um, this year we worked with the Administrative Advisory Council, which is a group of volunteers on the staff, staff members, teachers, plus uh, all the administrators to create uh, a student advisory plan that will be implemented in the fall. Um, so that plan will revolve around a curriculum created around mentor texts, kind of like our current respect curriculum, um, but our what we've been doing for the past several years, our 30 minute respect assemblies will pivot to a little bit of shorter all school time to like 15 or 20 minutes. Um, a 15 or 20 minute school wide meeting that'll introduce the respect value for that month such as responsibility. Uh, and then students are gonna break into cross grade level groups that'll be advised by a staff member um, who will act as their respect advisor. Uh, and then in those groups, teachers will implement a lesson to be written over the summer and that'll support the work around that value um, so those smaller groups we think will allow for more discussion and interactions among the uh, students at different grade levels. So those groups will be cross grade level, uh, initially made up of third, fourth, and fifth graders mixed up. Those third graders will have the benefit of having that same advisor for three years. Um, and uh, so they'll be able to discuss those, uh, those respect values. Um, teachers on the team right now on the uh, Administrative Advisory Council in the process of recommending books. And um, we visited, Aaron and I both visited the um, Farrer School in, in Norwell. They have a similar situation happening there that they've implemented for many years, so we got to see that in action. And we're sort of using that as a model. I'm, I'm sort of adapting that for Alden. Um, and then further on, on that objective, we've had lots of visitors at our assemblies this fall. The fire department came. Um, to present on responsibility. We've had our school adjustment counselors there. We had uh, Duxbury High School athletes presenting and uh, Duxbury Free Library librarian is gonna come and talk about the summer reading program as a part of teamwork for our work with the Duxbury Free Library. Um, for objective two, we established a collaborative student tracking team starting in September. Uh, that's met weekly all year, and it's made up our, of our assistant principal, our school counselors, our school psychologist, and our nurse, uh, who often are the people who are fielding the types of issues they talk about at um, 
at that team, and uh, our curriculum supervisor and myself sit on that as well. Um, often students have certain tells like frequent visits to the nurse or constantly visiting the school adjustment counselors, repeated discipline issues, tardiness or absences, and this is provided like a, a weekly check-in point. These are conversations we've been having for years, sort of ad hoc, but this is organized into a one meeting where we meet every week and we really think about it. We're thoughtful about who's having conversations with each of those kids. We're noting it, keeping track of it, moving kids sort of in and out of that team as we discuss them. Um, we're sort of, you know, thinking them in, as almost tiered, like, like who, who might need support from a, a school counselor and the nurse and the assistant principal, you know, who, who, have, who have been benefiting from our interventions, uh, who's maybe moving off of our list completely and can be in the archived category, right? And so it's just kind of formalized our, our work around, um, around at-risk students. Um, and uh, on Student objective, strategic objective three. Um, this year was our first using iReady, our universal screening tool. Ms. Wieson went over a little bit of what that means. Um, so our teachers were trained in the fall and the winter, and our curriculum supervisor attended trainings in uh, October and March. Um, further, our math uh, specialist worked with 24 teachers this year to individual, individually to effectively use that iReady data uh, and to help train them on the uh, personalized My Path program as a part of iReady. Um, and her coaching included uh, resources for fluency, independent practice, small group instruction, co-planning, co-teaching, analyzing data, providing work, preventing, providing work extensions. She's been a real value add for our teachers um, because ultimately it's great to close gaps with intervention, but a more um, efficient way of closing gaps is to improve teaching practice in all classrooms. Uh, and I think she's been a real benefit to that. Um, and Mrs. Benoit worked with the intervention team to create a workflow to publish iReady student reports, which were added this year, uh, enrolling those out into Aspen. Um, we've also communicated using our Alden Family Newsletter as far as um, educating parents on what those student reports look like, what they mean, how to read them. Um, we've had plenty of data meetings. Our fall data meetings included professional development for our teachers for iReady, um, to, uh, using data to inform instruction. Um, our teachers analyze data and receive professional development on making instructional decisions around that data. So it's one thing to collect data, spit out data at school committee, but you have to use it effectively, change your practice by looking at that data and what do students need. Um, and we um, use the next step resources to inform the tier one and tier two instruction. Um, we also used iReady data to, in our student support team as, a, as sort of a focal point um, to make decisions about uh, how to intervene with students, setting goals for students um, across specific domains in reading and math. Um, I also wanted to mention some um, intervention status data, and this is on the next slide. Um, so in this graph, uh, it's each series of bars represents a grade and a subject. So like grade three reading, then grade three math, and then grade four reading, and grade four math. Um, and so the gold represents the number of students receiving uh, intervention in that grade level and subject. The green is the number of students in that intervention group who met grade level benchmarks by the winter. So they exited by the winter out of intervention. Um, the blue is then the next group receiving intervention the winter. So that's all the people in gold plus any added, all the people in gold who didn't exit out plus anybody we brought on. Um, and then although it's not in the grade three reading category, if you look over to math, the, the light or mint green is, um, represents students that are on target to exit uh, in the spring data, with the spring data point, okay? And then that, that last dark blue uh, line or bar is students on target to likely make their stretch goal. And the stretch goal is a little different than meeting grade level it's meeting the stretch goal as determined in, the, the, in iReady. So it's great progress, but it's not quite getting to where we ultimately need them yet. So to compare that to what you saw with Chandler School, it's sort of the kids who are gonna be probably still receiving intervention, um, but it's sort of to show they have made progress. They're making that stretch goal that, they, that was what we wanted them to do, but they're still, they'll still be receiving intervention. 
Um, many, and sorry, how many yeah. students are in the third grade total? Do you know? Uh, about 200. I don't know the number off the top of my head now. So, sorry, are these numbers of students? They're like numbers. So like, so like the gold, the gold is approximately, I think it's 16 off the top of my head from what I remember. Um, so you can see over to the left about how many are receiving intervention in each of those, but it so doesn't have the numbers. I know on. we had this conversation already, but these aren't necessarily the same kids. They're not the, the same. Well, I would say it's some of the kids from the gold, but then it's additional kids because, you know, the, the domains kind of change as you're, in, as you're going across the... Uh, through the curriculum in grade three, right? So, so it's bringing in new kids who have been flagged, and it's bringing along the ones that are still not at the, uh, has, who still haven't met the grade level goal. Um, and then this next slide sort of gives you a perspective of what that intervention population looks like against the whole school population. So the gray represents the total students in the school at that grade level. So like grade three reading, I mean, and the, the numbers are all the same. 195 in grade three, thank you. Um, so, you, and you can see that in there, right? So that gray bar is 195 students. And then going back, that gold is the total number of kids who received intervention in grade three reading as compared to the 195. And then the, the dark green is the kids who exited Right? So it's sort of taking a, a zoom out from that previous bar graph to sort of see how everyone compares to the rest of the non-intervention students. And when, we, when you talk about the kids who are flagged for intervention based on the assessments, that is for that particular assessment on a given domain within the assessment, or I mean, whatever It's whatever on our I, It's in our iReady benchmarks. So it just, it's like, this is the cutoff. So it, you know, these kids are not performing where we would expect them to at X point, and therefore they get pulled out. Right. And it doesn't coincide with MCAS or kind of any of the ways, the other ways. Every assessment is independent, I guess is what I'm saying. And so there's not a correlation between. Right. We use iReady as our universal screener to determine interventions. Right. Yes. Okay. Now, I say, I say that so definitively, but I will say, I mean, there have been times in, like, during our SST process, right, where, where and that's, you know, our SST processes were taught, you know, a, teach, a teacher will refer someone to student support team, and a, a group of us look at them, and it might be, oh, they're, they're, maybe they're struggling in these certain things in math, and we, a point we always make is, well, are they receiving, you know, Title I math services? And we look up that data, and we say, well, they're not, but it, they were right on the cusp, right of and the, so we might say well let's as a part of the SST process do a six week intervention anyway even though they didn't like meet that number right. so so i said so definitively that we use i ready but we're flexible when we when the need is there depending on the student yeah. yeah of course yeah okay so thank you and i will take any questions you might have for me so all these assessments that you do are available to the parents in Aspen or are there's given? A, yeah, there's a parent report that we publish, I think, and Rita Marie's here, she can correct me, I think we publish it three times a year. Each okay. time they do an assessment. They go home in boulders. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Get your eye ready. That's great. Thank you. So can, do you guys, so I feel like when we talk about this stuff, which is important, we're talking about assessments we use to flag kids who need intervention, right? Um, and that's important and that's what your teams are talking about when you're trying to determine how you navigate the year for, for kids. Obviously you want people to get up to where they should be in that given grade. Um, do, you, do you look at the data or do you have, I'm sure you do, that's a ridiculous question. How, how do you look at the data and, and it would be interesting to me to see what does this data tell us about gen ed? Um, what's going well, what's not? How, what does that tell you about, you know, the curriculum you're using, areas where it's really strong or where there are challenges, and then, and also, and you alluded to this a little bit, in terms of how it relates to professional development. So it's great to see the data. Obviously, it's really important to be using it for its purpose, which is to define the services we know kids are going to need. Um, but looking at it at sort of like a much higher strategic level and how it informs decision making that you make. Yeah, around. and we do that um, at staff meetings. We do that at grade level meetings. Um, and I think, you know, there's like literally dozens of other layers of data that right. we're not right. talking about right now, like right. that of we, can, we right. can break it down in all these different ways. 
Um, and, you know, by domain, you know, in reading and math and talk about specific, you know, topics and, um, you know, all sorts of things. And so I think that's part of what we do all the time. Yeah. And um, Sarah Milner does a great job at Chandler of, you know, doing, we do like data celebrations at um, staff meeting where she talks about grade level data and, you know, the points in which, you know, the data is really strong in particular domains yeah. and then where we need to work, you know, right. and so that's, that's how we're focusing professional development. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I just have one, the connectedness survey, is that actually, is it happening? Yeah, so that's something that was headed up by our assistant principal, and I know we looked into doing one connectedness survey with um, the, uh, I forget what it was, I'm not placing the word, but I think ultimately we're not doing that. We are doing a different, we are doing, a, we're sending a survey out, but I don't think we're doing a, uh, the, we're not ending up doing the student survey. Okay, I was just curious how that would work at that grade level, but thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're going to stay. And I was just going to say, I think you're staying up here for the School Athletic Handbook Code of Conduct Revisions presented by our principals. Should I move over? Sure. And I think we're holding off on the Athletic Handbook. Is that right? We're I think all, we're all was it open to Mr. Maven? Yes. And order. there weren't any revisions to the student, the student Athletic Handbook. Okay. Um, but I also told him that um, we could push that to the. Um, June 7th meeting okay when we're doing the secondary um, school improvement plans if there was anything he wanted to highlight okay so we'll just move that under future yes. all right take it away I don't know who wants to go first okay because I really don't have many changes but I'm happy to Uh, I mean, I'll say I'll say something similar. I, I didn't present very many changes. I had reformatted and rewritten a lot of the handbook last year, um, so it's fairly minor. It's fairly minor things. And if there are specific questions about anything, I'm happy to answer them. I'm going to say the same thing. <laughs> if there are any questions about any of the proposed changes, um, but they're. Um, really specifically adding some language uh, that existed in other places and trying to get it all housed in that handbook document consistently um, in alignment with the other schools as well. High school is pretty basic. You know, we, we added the exist uh, to the existing language to help clarify it. Um, and, you know, based out of the um, TFM, we're going to add something for our our code of con or our um, um, the stuff that's in there for the code of conduct when it comes to suspension hearings and all that stuff. Um, but the one thing that we're adding is a little bit different. It's just really language around co-curricular guide guidelines and participation, um, right there, page 35. And what that is is just really clarity on the rule that kind of is left over to be vague and kind of. Um, pushes it back onto the coach or the co-curricular advisor, which is unfair to them. Uh, but that a student who's not in attendance the day before an event or um, a, say, uh, concert or something, if they're not in attendance without excuse, uh, they're not able to participate. So that just puts clarity on there. So the coaches or the co-curricular advisors aren't put in a tough spot, and that comes from the school, not them. So mm -hmm. a lot of times they can be put in a situation or scenario where they don't want to be, and they don't want to upset anybody or make the wrong decision. So that helps them out in the long run. I just have a question about the alls and behavior chart. Um, sure. Is it? Was it written in conjunction with staff? I mean, was there, like, I don't know how to eloquently put, I guess, my questions, but um, just, like, I guess the categories, like, unexpected, scary, or mean, um, like, threatening to leave someone out of a group or activity. Um, and then staff respond every time. So if a student says like I'm not going to invite you to my birthday is that considered like unexpected scary or mean and a staff intervenes I'm not trying to make I'm just trying to understand like the language yeah, of it um, so 
the school what reflects here is some some minor changes made to that okay that's been a that's been something in our handbook for a long time yeah i i more or less brought that with me from my previous um district okay. nine years ago okay. so um we worked on it somewhat with staff here uh i presented it to staff as a thing like this is something we use in our old my old district it, uh, it clarifies for me as the person at the time handling most school discipline like what happens when and yeah. categorizing behaviors and like framing the language for me to talk to kids about it um, they liked it we started using it and then this year there were some tweaks made to it to kind of change some language based on how we've kind of changed our language over the years with it so um, so the answer to the staff yes yes the staff uses that they're on board with it um, your specific example, um, I, I guess I'm not sure. I think it would be contextual, kind of, as to like what, especially with with your specific example. It's like, well, how how was that said? I mean, a lot of times kids say something because it's just information they they feel like they're sharing and they're not meaning for it to be like, you know. So I think that would all go into it, like thinking about. Yeah, I think that's my question. I think, and that's a, like, I think that's great. Is that is is like context and yeah. intention taken right. in because they're eight years old. So exactly. I think yes. I, I get like staff responding every time. I'm just trying to understand like a level of response or like discipline. For and I think that's, that's to delineate too, like the difference between sometimes when an administrator gets involved versus a teacher. So like that example you gave is probably something teachers deal with in the moment especially at i would say probably especially at chandler school or in third grade fourth grade like all the time yeah. every time there's a birthday party uh whereas like if if that like that kind of situation would never come to the office yeah okay that's what okay so i have to say that this is the first time i've ever looked at the behavior chart okay. and i mean i've had kids go through all this so sure. the fact that this has been around for eight years and I was on it last year of the school committee and I didn't look at it as disgraceful on my part. Um, I understand the need for structure, especially with this age group who like to, you know, kind of create some independence for themselves and sow their oats a little bit, but I'm a little concerned that it's a little, it's a little harsh. Okay. Um, and as an Italian that has a lot of facial expressions and hand gestures, I'd be concerned that I'd be in trouble all the time because of okay. um, negative facial expressions and eye rolling and I just, and a lot of the physical aggressions, the pushing, the shoving, I just feel like active children, especially my boys in general, and then a strong-willed person, I just feel like they may have, get in trouble a lot within this criteria and I understand the need for a safe space, but I also feel like we need children to learn how to not be invited to everything and not be included in any, everything and to develop those skills. And I just feel like we're trying to create this safe space without creating an avenue for children to kind of understand that everything is not going to go their way either. And, um, and then on the flip side of that, I'm kind of moving, but I feel like kids need to be able to get that, some of that aggression out at recess. And there is that fine line between just roughhousing and physical aggression. So I just have a lot of concerns I think with the, what's written. Yeah, I think the tricky thing when you, when you think about this, like from a developmental standpoint, I think the other thing is just trying to figure out like Alden, you know, we have this kind of very specific thing in this handbook. And then at Chandler, obviously it's a different age group, but we're talking about elementary students, right? K to five. Some places have those all in one building. We happen to separate them out. Um, and I think when I look at the handbooks in general, to me it, it would, when we talk about um, like vertical alignment for students as they move through the buildings, it would be great to see vertical alignment for families as they move through the buildings. And so to me, when I looked at these, and I think the tricky thing is, again, school councils review them kind of in the context of their school, right, which is, makes total sense. And then they're sort of elevated to here, and we look at them all as, as a whole bigger picture. And that was where it sort of became clear to me that they're – it's almost like you, it, when I went, I looked through the Chandler handbook and then I looked to the Alden handbook and it was like I was, I was leaving the district and going to another school maybe. There's, there's, it's just a really different um, 
sort of look and feel and context. And I think Matt had alluded to this the last time we reviewed these actually about um, whether we consider um, a common format across the board, a common table of contents so that each time you move into a building, the information is all there because so much of it is the same. But if it, it looks and feels so different, you wouldn't necessarily have that experience. Um, and so I think part of it was just understanding and again, also from the developmental piece that Kristen was alluding to, which is just, this is part of the handbook, and so I'm assuming it's used with students, um, which is, is good. I, the content here, in some cases, I think is, is challenging for me from a developmental standpoint of, um, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Um, about what I understand about sort of kids this age, but I think I look at things like civil rights violations and harassment and things, and it's really hard for me to understand how you talk to an eight, nine, ten year old about that kind of thing if that's going to be listed here as a behavior for which they will be accountable. Um, so this the the language here feels a little bit elevate com compared to when I look at Chandler um, and the language and the green. The respect idea is similar, right? We go green respect, I get that. This sort of seems to elevate, this chart is just very different um, for kids and families as they move into Alden. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't feel like as big a jump in age to me when we go from second to third grade, but when you look at it across the handbooks and, and this piece of it, I think that's where it was, it's just sort of a, it's different, it's very different. So I'll, I'll leave it there, um, but I think Again, Matt had mentioned it before about thinking about ways to kind of look at these across the, the buildings and find some ways to have it. I mean, I think there's elementary and secondary maybe. I don't think the um, Chandler and middle school handbooks are probably gonna look very similar, which is fine. Um, but maybe having more of a partnership in the two elementary schools and then the secondary pieces, which actually I think they're pretty similar in what is incorporated. Um, but just something to think about from a, from a family's experience of, of how they move from one building to the next and, and what they're signing and understanding of how things are going to go in that building. Just anecdotally, do you get parental questions when they read this or are we not hearing from parents? Yeah. You don't hear from parents until they have to do it. I have not, right. yeah, I've not I gotten parents. a single question I mean, about the handbook. <laughs> I, I, you okay. know what, I've sent three kids through Alden and I didn't know they couldn't roll their eyes. I certainly would have been spoken to as a student, so. No, I'm not trying to make light of it, but I, I think it's circumstantial and it's evidence-based and if it's probably a continual issue. But it says they'll be spoken to every time, so it's semantics, right? Well, I think it's every time any of those things are a problem. Exactly. <laughs> it's not, you know. Better said, yes. I guess my, my big concern is that, or another concern is that I just don't want kids getting labeled as problematic off of what I consider age appropriate behaviors. And then that label can follow with them and can really be detrimental in their development of self-confidence. And we wouldn't want to squash somebody who's strong-willed and that's really going to make a change in the world. And I just feel like it's very punitive in nature and I understand that it could be, it is, you know, situation based, but what it's written, it just has a lot of, what's the word? Like it, it has a lot of like, you Ready? can't do any, yes, exactly. So that was my concern with that. But any, any other questions? No. I would just like this to get looked at by the school council. Let's just say that and revisited. Um, and brought back to us maybe in, after your first meeting with them sure. and kind of get their input on it. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. I guess okay. I'm curious, are, are, so, and this is rookie move here, which I feel like I ask these questions every single oh, meeting. Yeah. So school councils review these, then they're elevated and the school council or school committees in theory, we review the recommendations and the changes that are made. Ideally we read the handbooks cover to cover so that we understand. And then we are essentially approving that handbook I mean that's our sort of vote of approval I think what you're doing is ensuring that the handbooks are in line with the um, school committee policies 
that's the purpose of that's why it's elevated to school committee. So um, what you're doing is ensuring that the school handbooks are in line with the school committee policies. And if you have concerns that they're not, this is an opportunity to discuss it. I think um, having it go back to school councils is appropriate, and I think that the principals have done that. But if there's further discussion that you'd like around that, we can certainly go back. But I think that um, just to kind of chime in about why it might be a little bit more specific at Alden than Chandler is exactly what one of you mentioned, just, is just that developmental level and developmental approach to being able to further explain what appropriate respectful behavior looks like and to give some examples so that it's not just a um, opinion of one person over another of what's respectful and what isn't. So I think it's just allowing for some consistency with conversations and I don't, um, I definitely would agree with you. We don't ever want to um, have someone labeled as a, a, a problem student and I don't think that's the goal of it. I think it's just a way for us to, as the kids get older and they're getting ready to go to the middle school, it's that transition few years at Alden School where you start to see um, kids coming into themselves a little bit and testing some limits and so I think giving those concrete examples of what behaviors would be considered disrespectful in context and I think the adults would um, manage a lot of those in their classroom setting on a day-to-day -day basis but um, we can certainly take a look at the chart and I think what we can always do as well is have joint school council meetings so if it's a conversation between Chandler and Alden school councils to look at how behaviors are managed and to have the handbooks reflect that I think that would certainly be a worthwhile exercise I just don't know that the September meeting when they're well, finalizing just, their school yeah, improvement plans fine. but I think in the fall if there's an opportunity to have Chandler and Alden school councils get together to talk about um, the handbook and how discipline and behavior is, is listed out to make it more flow more nice nicely so that it, it is developmentally consistent um, as the kids progress in grades we could certainly do that okay. yeah that idea with what Dr. Klingman is saying about us ensuring that they're compliant with policy that was what I was getting at at the last review when I was seeing that, you know, one handbook was referencing uh, an old policy and another reference was like a new policy. So I wasn't trying to get at consistency around how they run the building. It was more just references to ensure that like references to policy that we're responsible for were in line. Right. I think it was, you know, formatting and things like that too, yeah. you mentioned. So if that is the intention, um, then I do have one more comment and then we can. Yes. Um, I think a little bit of this got brought up in the last, in the, the bullying policy and the link to the prevention and whatever it's called, the bullying plan. Um, I think when I was looking to see which, where the policies for school committee are referenced in the handbooks, I think each of them do it a little bit differently and, and I think, and it's more a way to sort of have a multiple checks and balances in place actually to ensure that information isn't existing in places where we don't realize and then we update a policy but we don't update the language elsewhere and so right now there's like a lot of stuff if you start googling you get like old policies and old handbooks which is just the nature of the ever-living internet um, but I think as long as it's clear obviously the years are labeled within the handbooks it, it would be great if every single time a school committee policy is referenced it's named and linked specifically to the existing school policy on our school committee website in the way that they're organized now, I think that's a little bit easier than it might have been before. Um, but I think I was, my concern was that in a lot of places the handbooks say like, they don't specifically name the policy. It'll say under a, a, a heading, you know, please refer to district school committee policy. I think ideally we name the policy and hyperlink it every single time if you're doing that. Because that way not only are parents in theory accountable for realizing that there is in fact a direct link there and that the actual language to which they are signing and hold, held accountable is in the policy as opposed to just a reference. Um, and I think there's, it's pretty consistent where the school committee policies represents absence, bus transportation, harassment, bullying, visitors, volunteers, homework, code of conduct, Title IX, and restraint. I think across the board you guys all reference our policies, but we don't, they're not called out by name every time and they're not hyperlinked. Um, and that will just prevent 
the wrong policy from being linked, I think, or referenced or named um, going forward so that, again, families read them, they see that, it's clear, and then when language is updated in the school committee policy, assuming those links are maintained, then it's automatically updated in the handbook. I guess that's what I'm wondering. So if we ask for that change, do we then have to revisit these? I can say, um, I make, uh, I wrote it down. Can I have a motion to approve the school code of conduct revisions presented by our principals with the addition of adding hyperlinks for the policies and a review of the behavior chart at Alden by the school councils? Can I say that? Yes, you can. We didn't have a chance to talk about the code of conduct changes yet. Oh, I'm sorry. But you can make a motion to approve the handbooks as presented, because that was really what our conversation was right now with those changes. Should I say that again? Sure. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the school handbooks with the addition of hyperlinks? Are you guys okay with that, the hyperlinks, adding them? Yeah. The only question I have is with the new website, if we have to wait until that rolls to link anything. We should just keep that in mind so that we're actually going to. I think we can hype. I think we can hype hyperlink it now, and when the rollover happens, we'll make sure all the hyperlinks are still working and going to the same policy that we're redirecting them to. I don't know if the domain um, link will be the same, but that would be something we don't have to wait. Yeah, if it's I just mean, a few, I don't want you, you doing double like work. Do the, I personally don't do the handbook changes until over the summer because yeah. it's like changing people's names that haven't been hired yet. Yeah, like right, so right. Those are all things that we do over the summer, so hopefully the. Um, Perfect. Okay, we don't want you double working, so we can wait until that's. I can add that in too. I guess the point is. <laughs> I can have a very all long the motion. Changes are made before they're launched in the fall, and everybody signs them, right? Yes. I mean, that's the yeah. point. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay, I'm going to try this again. Can I have a motion to approve the school handbooks with hyperlinks after the? website is launched and with the review of the Alden behavior chart with the school councils. So, so moved. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. On to the code of conduct. I added the changes in a memo of the code of conduct. These changes um, came about as a result of our tiered focus monitoring review. And um, there are two changes. So one of the changes is um, under suspensions, and that was due to an update of um, a mass general law. And so that is just reflective of the language of the mass general law. And then the second component is addi additional procedural protections for special education section 504 accommodation plan students. And that was also noted in our tiered focus monitoring um, review. Another piece of it is for us, um, as we are talking about adding different links and components into the handbooks, is that we added the entire code of conduct and it's, um, you know, the entire piece of part of it, I'm sorry, not the entire part of it, it doesn't even make sense. <laughs> we added the entire code of conduct into the handbooks so that you can read the entire um, code of conduct in the handbooks. So that was another change. Um, and so this memo just highlights the updates to the code of conduct, and this is also reflected in the handbooks. I just had um, one clarifying question mm -hmm. for the 10 days of the school year. Does that include in-school suspension or like a lunch suspension? Is it a full day? In Which part are you yeah. that piece? In this the, fed piece. Oh, okay says like um, from their program Special education students for more than 10 days. Program for up to 10 days per so school like year. would it in school suspension counts and like what no. a lunch no Not like no lunch <laughs> no or okay full day. Just in school or out of school suspension. so full day yeah. okay okay and the code of conduct just for an educational purpose is dictated um, by by who by did, did we write this did DPS write this or did we get it do we get a template or like how how did that how does that work I guess it's a school committee policy is my understanding I've learned that yes are I you asking who writes it I, well I'm asking yeah 
Yeah. Or I like, is this something that kind of gets handed down from Desi and everybody um, makes it their own? I think so. So your policy is the it's basis for right. the code of conduct, and it's probably been developed through, through the years with needed changes that have gone through the school committee and administration as things have come up and changed. So Great. Um, I think everyone has a unique code of conduct. There's not one standard code of conduct that the whole state of Massachusetts falls under, but we all fall under the same mass general law within our code of conduct. Right. Okay. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the code of conduct revisions? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And while you are all here, I just want to thank you for uh, all your hard work. There has been a lot of ups and downs for all schools, um, and I think you guys have done a wonderful job navigating it and providing some consistency and strength for our students and staff. So thank you. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, principals. All right. Our second reading of our bullying prevention plan and policy, JICFB, with updated recommendations. Okay, I'll start with the policy. So the policy subcommittee met, um, and we met with everyone. We met with all the principals, and we, we went over with the fine tooth comb what we thought was our understanding. So the policy really has no changes. Um, other than some language stuff, changing his or her to there. Um, so I just wanted to reiter reiterate on page three of five um, from our policy. Uh, the principal or their designee upon receipt of a viable report shall promptly contact the parents or guardians of a student who has been the alleged target or alleged perpetrator of bullying. So that is right in our policy. I know we talked about do parents get called. Um, so yes. And then underneath that, the next um, paragraph says, support staff shall assess an alleged target's needs for protection and create and implement a safety plan that shall restore a sense of safety for that student. So that's, that's you know, again, alleged. And then um, if you go down two, three more paragraphs, the investigation shall be completed within 14 school days from the date of the report. And that language has been um, input to the bullying prevention program. Um, the bottom of that page, it says disciplinary actions for students who have committed an act of bullying or retaliation shall be in accordance with district disciplinary policies. We kind of wanted to just um, sort of highlight that, that that's sort of the the first part is, you know, maybe something went on, maybe it didn't, everybody's talking to everybody, and then, okay, so now we think we have an issue, um, and so we wanted to just highlight that confidentiality shall be maintained to the extent consistent with the school's obligations under law. So once it becomes a bullying investigation, um, the school can talk to students, you know, some, or if it goes beyond that, um, we have to follow the law, basically, is what. And then target assistance, the Duxbury Public Schools shall provide counseling or referral to appropriate services, including guidance, academic intervention, and protection to students, both targets and perpetrators, affected by bullying as necessary. And again, that is, is if it's deemed bullying. So that's, we didn't have to change any of our language in our policy. It, it um, complies with everything we needed to. And then Beth, do you wanna sure. link it into the? And then so to um, speak to the reflection of that in the updated bullying prevention plan on page 11, we did include under student safety, the safety of all involved, including the alleged target and or alleged aggressor will be considered for safety plans or protective measures at any time a report of potential bullying is made if appropriate. We also added a line um, under obligation to notify others. On page 11 as well, the principal or designee contacts parents, guardians before any investigation. Um, and then, so that was added. And then on page 12 to al also reflect the um, language of the policy under investigation at the bottom of that paragraph, the investigation shall be completed within 14 school days from the date of the report, or at a minimum, the principal or designee 
shall contact the parents or guardians as to the status of the investigation on a weekly basis. So that speaks to the communication piece. Um, and then we went throughout the plan um, to update and ensure that alleged is in front of aggressor as appropriate. We added a lot of alleged, I can say. <laughs> There's hundreds of alleged in this plan at this time. Thank and you. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Any questions? Kelly, this is more of a policy question. So mm -hmm. I just, I, as I was reading through and thinking back to the discussion that we had, I was trying to, <laughs> trying to remember what we had said. Um, I think my main question is um, why do we need to maintain this high level of detail starting it at reporting where we delineate all this language which then we duplicate in the plan I mean is there something to be said for why can't we just say <laughs> as indicated in the so that we're only having to update language in one place I guess this is what I was getting to earlier well our policy the policy itself mirrors the mask policy and that's what we need to have as our approved school committee policy. Okay. And I think the bullying prevention plan, because it's its own standing document, needs to have its own language. So as a policy and through DESE, we're required to have a full bullying prevention plan. And because of this is one of the components of tiered focus monitoring compliance that they need to see. We can't just say see policy. Just the same reason we had to put the code of conduct, the entire wording of the code of conduct into our handbooks. They want to see um, a high level with great detail bullying prevention plan that the district follows. Also in line with your bullying policy. So yeah, unfortunately, they both have to be updated whenever they have to whenever be updated. Whenever they have to be updated, yep. and the lang as long as the language is comparable. Yeah, but MASK is pretty good about giving us a heads up whenever there's any language changes. Yeah, we just then legally have, then you have to remember to go mm -hmm. back in and change the language in the plan, which is fine. Um, yeah, and then will there just be like an actual link from the school committee policy to the plan, and vice versa? I guess would be the the hope there. Or certainly in our policy, we should hyperlink where we say <laughs> the prevention intervention plan that we hyperlink to the plan. And I think then it should those, be both. Then I those think, are linked, right? Yeah, I yeah. think they should be linked to one another. Right. Yep. So if we have enough, when we have the updated JICFB, we can link it right to the plan. And vice versa. Right. Yes, exactly. Any other questions? I, I just have one point. So um, the, the policy uh, that we reviewed like Kelly was saying, we, I think what we talked about last time was to make sure that the, uh, the policy was updated and that the, uh, the definitions were all tight. So I think we decided that when we, when we made all the updates, you can see the lines and the, um, the bold and italics. When we made the updates to up to make it consistent with mask, you know, we wanted to make sure that that consistency meant that all the definitions were straight. But the one thing that I would point out, um, Kelly said on, you know, Kelly pointed out on page three, the policy, the mask policy that we're consistent with says support staff shall assess an alleged target's needs for protection and create and implement a safety plan that shall restore a sense of safety for that student. Unless I'm missing something, that's not consistent with what you said last week, last meeting. So, I would just call that out to ask if you, if you believe we should change that and supersede the mask policy. Well, we want protection for all parties involved, and you updated that nicely, correct? So maybe in the bullying prevention plan, yeah, so we want to supersede the mask policy and change our policy so that it's there's extra language, because we've talked before about other policies not superseding masks. So I just wanted to point that out to see if we wanted to do that here. This is this thing about the language not being this, you know, you have these two things and the language is the same. I agree. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so we change, I mean, we could, we could vote on it and just, we could vote on it with a, a flag for this particular line. So what do you, so we're what just are you proposing? proposing you want to add to that, Matt? <clears throat> well, I, I just, I think I'd like to know what the committee thinks if we should, if we should update that one line in the policy. To be consistent with what our, with what's under number one on page 11 of the plan, which is the safety of all involved, including, right, it's just changing the language. Or yeah. Or because that is what was discussed. Yep. Right. Last. So we just have to add um, 
or alleged aggressors. Right. Support staff shall assess an alleged targets and, and alleged and slash or alleged aggressive. Yeah, aggressors needs for protection. Is that do we yeah. just need to add that? Yeah. Okay. For all students and then yeah. Okay. And the definitions are the same. The definitions that are now in the plan exactly mirror the math and math. that plan. Yeah. Yes, yes. they do. Okay. Great. Thank yes. you. Policy subcommittee. Okay. Where so, is that line going to go? Can I just clarify? Where it's um so page three supports staff under investigative procedures. It's the second paragraph. I have the investigative procedure. For, for JICFD. Starts with support staff shall assess. You could just add in the line or alleged perpetrator because two paragraphs up it go? says okay. alleged okay. target or, or alleged. So you could say <clears throat> shall assess an alleged targets or an alleged perpetrators needs needs okay. for protection. Okay. For those students. Yeah, for all students or for those students. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. Can I have a motion to approve the bullying prevention plan and policy JICFB with the addition of the N slash or alleged perpetrator and all students in addition to the hyperlinks to connect both the policy and the prevention plan? I think no? We, I think we should do separate votes, one for the policy and one for the plan. I think we have to That's approve fine. the policy, yeah. so one motion okay. for the policy. Can I have a motion <laughs> to approve, does it matter which one's first? Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the bullying prevention plan? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Can I have a motion to, I just, this is my audience. <laughs> Can I have a motion to approve policy JICFB with the updated language of and slash or alleged perpetrator and all students in addition to the hyperlinks that connect. I should have said that in the prevention plan. It's okay. It's okay. okay, and the hyperlinks. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, moving on to gifts. Lisa Freely, are you still there? Aye. Oops. Aye. Oops. Oh! Whoa. Sorry, you you Thank you, everybody, for Thank coming. You. Okay, um, so we have received a number of gifts um, since our last meeting. In your packet was um, a document for each of them. And nice. mm -hmm. in light of the gifts that we've been receiving lately and just proper documentation, um, I'd like to propose that gifts and donations to schools be a standing agenda item as routine matters whereby if there are gifts to schools, a copy of... Um, like a letter from the principals or the gift would be included in the packet. And then you take up review discussion or vote of the item at each session. And then if there's nothing that meeting, you would just say that there was nothing um, and then move along to the next agenda item. So you want that to be its own item? Just, yeah, just a standing item. Okay. So under new business or like another Roman numeral? Um. Uh, well, I called it routine matters, but it can go. It can go in the new business section, or it okay. can just go as its own as like a an item right after reports. Anyone have a preference? Yeah, I'd put it after reports. Okay. I think I'd like that. You could also put it under the report from the school director of business and finance, and then just oh, put yeah. an A under there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So she's the one that will present them, right? That's fine. And then you can put action required with that. I think it That's should be its I own. It should, it should be its own. Be its own. Yeah. I'm we'll do it under reports. I'm trying to pull up the policy that has the um, agenda. Does anyone remember? Oh, here it is. D E D D. So 
I just put the agenda format up on the screen. Okay. Where would you like to add? Under reports? No, after it. I mean, that's why it's under. So oh, yeah, yeah, so yep. it's number five. Yep. Okay. And is its own item yep. under five with um, uh, action required? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And then will we have to approve that policy update? Yes. Okay, so we'll do that next meeting? Okay. All right, Lisa, do you want to go over the... Um, Okay. The gifts. Um, and you will need to vote on each one, I believe. Okay. Um, so the first one is um, to Duxbury Public Schools in the amount of $2,500 from Vance Thomas. Um, there is one, two for Alden School, totaling $800. One from the Chandler PTA for the science fair, for the 2023 science fair, and one from the Alden PTA also for $400 for the 2023 Science Fair. And the last item is for Chandler Elementary School for $2,500 for the Integrated Preschool Program from the Chandler Elementary PTA. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve the gift of $2,500 to Duxbury Public Schools from Vance Thomas? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can we discuss? Oh, I'm sorry. Can we discuss? Oh, yeah, because that one, I don't know. I just, it came through as like a political action committee. I didn't understand that. Okay. Um, I can look into that one and get you more information for the next meeting. Yeah. Do you mind? I, I just. Yeah, no, not at all. I it didn't think that was. A, for, uh, I'll get more information. All right. Does anybody else? Well, it's a did you pick up on that? So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just don't yeah. understand. Like, is that okay? Like, I don't, right. I don't know. I think we need some more info on that one. And who's Vance? Okay. Who's Vance Thomas? And yeah. Yeah. And especially who, who, with everything Lynn's telling us. Yeah. It's, I don't know. I just thought okay. that was really interesting. So we're going to get more information on that? Yep. Yes. Okay. Any other discussions on any of the other gifts? We're doing them one at a time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I make a motion then discussion. Yep. Yep. Can I have a motion um, to approve the $400 for the 2023 Science Fair from the Ch Chandler Elementary PTA? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, thank you for the gift, Chandler Elementary PTA. Can I have a motion to approve the gift of $400 for the 2023 Science Fair project or F Science Fair from the Alden PTA? So moved. Second. Any discussion? No. No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Last but not least, can I have a motion to approve the gift of $2,500 for the Chandler Integrated Preschool from the Chandler Elementary PTA in the amount, did I say in the amount of $2,500? So oh. moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I okay. have a question about this. I um. So what happens if someone can't pay their tuition for preschool at the integrated preschool? If a family can't meet the like, like only, if they just can't pay their tuition and only peers pay, right? Yeah. yeah. So That's students right. yeah. that are on IEPs don't pay. Don't, don't pay, pay, and any students that are there as peer models would have the tuition. Um, and I believe we follow the same free and reduced lunch um, application. Sure. And so there's also mechanisms if families can't pay to um, work with the school district. So we try to be flexible with families. And there's different payment plan options. So was this requested or was this just the PTA was thinking outside the box and gave $2,500? This is an item that they have um, provided in the past in prior years. Oh. So, um, and I, I will say I don't know the process so I can get more information, um, but in the event that families are seeking um, financial assistance, um, these funds are used towards that. Um, I don't know exactly what that process looks like, but I can get more information if you'd like. I just, I was on the PTA for a year. I've known that I was the treasurer for years too. I've just never heard of it. Um, it was just, I mean, it's fine. I just was more curious if that was a common use of Historical. fundraising money to pay tuition. I mean, this PTA fundraises for all sorts of things. So I, I understand that that's where it's going. Um, I, I just know we have like a, 
they have that pizza, they have the chant, the integrated um, account, the same as kindergarten, correct, for the excess? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Revolving, Fun. Mm -hmm. So that's what this goes into? Yes. Yes. No, I'm sorry. Correction. This would go into, this will go into gifts to schools, which is a separate revolving account that all gifts to schools dollars go in once they're voted on. And then we track that separately. So this is independent of the um, integrated preschool revolving account, which is where tuition goes. So technically it could be used for anything. It cannot because the purpose of the gift is for the specific purpose that they outlined. Okay. Um, so it's earmarked, essentially. With so it's yes. just housed, but an, yeah, enumerated. Yes. So as, as gifts come in, if they are um, designated for a specific purpose by the donor, then we put them, we basically put them on a spreadsheet, for lack of a better way to track them. We put them on a spreadsheet, and then we track the funds and expenses, the funds that way. So it can only be used towards financial assistance for preschool tuition, where if, for instance, the boosters donated money to athletics for um, wrestling mats, we could only use those funds for wrestling mats. There are instances where folks donate um, for general, you know, mission, vision, and purpose operations of the particular schools. Um, that's not uncommon. Um, but we do see more often the, you know, the designated purpose. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do we vote now? Because yes. I already had motion. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Thank you for the gift, Chandler PTA. Um, the last line of business is the school committee virtual office hours platform. Um, and we discussed this in our Monday meeting. And Dr. Klingeman offered to have us use the Duxbury Public School Zoom and that it would be set up through the superintendent office. Is that work? Okay. And then um, kind of going off of that, I was wondering if we can even do this next month, or next, not next month, in, in September. But instead of having predetermined dates for the office hours, have each of us pick a month or two months. It would be two months for the 10. Um, and then in that month, we'll pick the day that best works our schedule. And then if someone can meet us, instead of having the predetermined dates. You as the designee for that month for that get month. to pick the dates pick the based date on that your works. availability so that it doesn't, so everybody can participate based on their schedule as opposed Correct. to maybe it's difficult given the projected dates, right? Can I go back to the Zoom thing? Yeah. One thing. So um, this would be the school Zoom account that we would use? Yes. And so that means like when the office hour comes up, the individual moderator would log into that Zoom account? Yes. So the only thing that I'd be concerned about is that we do that now, but just with a different Zoom account. And I think the problem has been um, verification. Remember? Mm -hmm. So like when an outside, when a, when another person, and you know how you, this works like when you haven't logged into Google for a while, or you log into Google from another computer, and it's like, hey, you need a verification. That's what's been the problem. It's not been the platform. It's been like Laurel's tried to log in and it's asked for a validation code. So she goes into that email address that I set up and then it's like, now you gotta check your cell phone. Code. So I was gonna suggest that, I was thinking about it the other day, I was gonna suggest that um, the moderator just take ownership to schedule the meeting. So like this, the central office still does the sign up genius, right? Right, so I don't. Val, Val, uh, Val Kelly wants to do office hours. So Val signs up for the six o'clock slot. You're gonna moderate. You just, you go into your calendar and you schedule the six to 6.20 through Google Meet. Okay. On, 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 you know, you know how, cause we use Google Calendar, we all have this. So you're you. Duxbury Duck K-12. Yeah, Google exactly. So you just, email. you, you, you schedule a six to 6.20 with Val and you just click, you just click um, schedule with Google Meet. And, and you can just do the same. 
then you invite the you then you invite. So then where's the Zoom? The, the person. It, there is no Zoom. Zoom. We use Google. Then we don't need to deal with Zoom. Does that have video functionality? Oh, it's totally. It's actually. I, I can show you. Essentially, the if you decide to do Google, we can show you how to do. Um, when you make a Google Calendar invite, if you invite the person that you're meeting with, are they all one on one? Yes. They are. Uh, yeah, right. except you could then you could also invite you could you invite the second person if there's, there's right. two members yeah, that could, are doing it. It's really we could we could um it's if that's what you want to do Google Meets is easy. That yeah. sounds better. And it would yeah. just be then it's the person Google. would provide instead of their mobile number maybe their email address so that you can send the invite. Well, we have their email address well, we because it comes from the sign of Genius. Yeah, okay, even better. It's, it's, I think it's pretty it's elegant. Best. Like, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then, are you okay with us each picking a month instead of having predetermined dates? Well, this was well, your me, thing. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think so, it was our thing. <laughs> I yeah, suggested I mean, it. We really but, like but yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. have no I problem with it. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Sounds yeah. flexible. All right. Okay. Excellent. And then you can manage your Google Meet, and that makes it a lot simpler. Yeah. And yeah. Kristen yeah. and everybody doesn't have to be involved. Huh? We only do them once a month. Right now, I think we'll be able to do once a month. Doing well. And I'll learn something. Did you have any problems, by the way? No. Oh, good. That's good. All right. So considerations for future agendas. Right now I have the athletic handbook um, changed to the agenda format. And what? No, that was it. Okay. I have one. Um, so Matt and I, the policy subcommittee, and I was chair this year. So in the spirit of rotating, I think we have to vote that he would be chair for this upcoming, upcoming cycle. year, okay. cycle, oh. whatever we call ourselves. We wouldn't have yeah. to vote on the, the chair. Oh, we don't? Oh, you just have to appoint. So you, if you want to do that at the next meeting. Can we do I it right chair? now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you can appoint I, the chair. I oh, can, can make a motion now, right? You don't have to. We don't have to make a motion. Okay. So I'm going to appoint, to appoint to Matt oh. to be yeah. chair of the policy okay. committee. Great. Subcommittee. Okay. Subcommittee. Policy right. subcommittee. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Any other future agenda items? Right now? Okay. So second public comment. Three minute time limit. <laughs> All right. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Second. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.